Soren Rand's corporate and securities practice is focused on advising entrepreneurs, startups, emerging growth, and middle market technology companies. This includes software, communications, marketing, and e-commerce companies, as well as the investors, directors, and executives who support and lead them. Having grown from three attorneys in November 2009 to over 30 attorneys and support staff today, Soren Rand knows what it takes to build a successful startup, and they apply this knowledge and experience with their clients every day. The question that you pose is sort of one of the most pressing questions for entrepreneurs today. People have wonderful ideas, great concepts, innovative technology, solutions to pressing problems that can increase revenue, decrease costs, drive profits, increase productivity, but they need capital to make those visions become a reality. One of the first places that an entrepreneur should look is at himself or herself skin in the game. How do you bring to bear some of your own resources to help satisfy or meet your goals? In fact, subsequent investors, people who are going to back an entrepreneur, often look to see the extent to which that entre entrepreneur was willing to bet on himself or herself. So skin in the game is very important. It is also critically important that an entrepreneur not be sort of a blind-eyed or, or optimist who is looking at things through rose-colored glasses and takes unacceptable or undue risk. You don't, want to make, you don't want to put yourself in a position where you simply can't meet your other obligations. So it's important to have that balance. As you go up the hierarchy, the next place to look is friends and family, what some people refer to as friends and family and fools. But you know, this is a situation where you have friends, members of your family, your extended network, who really like and support and, and share the passion for what the entrepreneur is trying to develop. And they will make an investment in the company. There's an irony here in that friends and family often value the enterprise more highly than might an institutional investor. And so they may actually, it may actually be a cheaper form of capital in the short run for an entrepreneur, but sometimes comes back and catches up with the entrepreneur later on when they're looking to raise money from an impartial or independent third party. There's a downside to raising money from friends and family, and that is the fact that you have this separate non-business relationship with them that could be colored or impacted by the business relationship. Uncle Harry all of a sudden thinks he or she is, a, well in this case he, is a co-owner of the business and has a right to tell you how to operate the business. Uh, friends or family looking for when are they going to get a return of capital. And so there's, there's a difficult balance. Friends and family clearly an important potential resource for early stage entrepreneurs. It should not be overlooked, but it should, the importance of it shouldn't be overstated either, and an entrepreneur needs to find the right balance. Beyond that, you network for, with people who are independent. One such group or, or class of people are angel investors. Angel investors are people who probably have had a, a level of success in their own careers prior to becoming angel investors. Often they've been uh, successful in an industry that is similar to or analogous to that of the entrepreneur and they want to back somebody in that industry who's now helping to move it forward. Finding angels is uh, sometimes difficult. So wherever you're located, it's important to find the angel networks that tend to invest in your particular geographic region. You know, unlike some institutional investors where geography is less important, in the angel world, geography is often critical. And so looking to the networks that exist in your particular area. You know, we have offices in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, for example. In New York, there's the New York Venture Capital Association. There are accelerator programs such as Entrepreneurs Roundtable or Dog Patch or Tech Stars. Um, these are important places for entrepreneurs to begin their search. 
in, join these organizations. The Executive Council in New York, which um, runs the New York Venture Capital Association, has networking events all year long. It's an opportunity to meet the people who are interested in various types of technology companies. In New Jersey, there's the New Jersey Technology Council. There's the Venture Association of New Jersey. There are also accelerator programs in New Jersey, such as Tech Launch or uh, the Princeton Innovation Garden. These are all opportunities for an early stage entrepreneur to meet the people who are interested in funding early stage enterprises. And it's very important that you're talking to the right prospective investor. There are scores and scores of investors out there, but investors tend to have particular areas of interest, whether it's a technology area of interest, a stage of development area of interest, whether they invest in companies that are pre-revenue or post-revenue. And so it's important that the entrepreneur recognize that going out and trying to talk to everybody is actually it's a waste of time and it's going to be counterproductive. It's important to fine tune your search and network with the right people. So how do entrepreneurs do that? You know, one way is they join the organizations I was just talking about, NJTC in New Jersey, Venture Association, Executive Council, PACT in Pennsylvania. But that's not enough. You want to make sure that you're networking with and surrounding yourself with the right team. So if you're a technology entrepreneur and your background is in innovation, whether it's engineering or medical sciences or devices, et cetera, you want to surround yourself with people on the financial side, the accounting side, the legal side, all of whom become prospective partners to help you meet the right people. There is nothing more valuable in that networking stage for a trusted advisor to provide with a warm introduction to a source of capital, whether it's an accelerator program that helps companies get off the ground, a seed capital fund or an angel investor, or a later stage venture capital fund. But the partnering that you do with your lawyers, with your accountants, your financial advisors is critical in helping you figure out who to meet and to have the introduction at the right level. So I would say network. Network is absolutely critical. Join the organizations in the area in which your company is being formed or in which you live. Think about the national organizations that um, are involved in your particular area of expertise and your technology or solution so that you can partner with those people. Moving up the food chain, you also need to think about corporate partners. This is an often overlooked source of not only capital, but other resources, research and development resources, laboratory resources, interns, et cetera. And so uh, it's important to think about what corporate or other business enterprises might have an interest in what it is you are developing. Think about how you can ally with them, whether it's a strategic alliance of some sort, a joint venture, a collaborative development arrangement, um, or even an equity investment by the corporate partner. It's a, a parallel path that I think most entrepreneurs should be thinking about if they're not already doing that. And of course, depending upon where you are in the stage of development, there are venture capital funds that are specific to particular type of industry, technology, whether it's financial tech, or referred to as fintech, clean technology, alternative energies, e-commerce solutions, medical devices, life sciences, et cetera. And it's important that you talk to the right people, the investors who specialize or focus in your particular area. It's important because they'll be a value-added investor. Not only will you be in the area of interest for them, but they are likely to have contacts, a network base, an experience base, and a skill set that allows them to be a value add to you so that they're not just providing you with money, which is critical, but they're providing you with all of those extras that are important in moving your company forward. Historically, 
early stage investors were primarily equity investors which means that they would purchase some of the capital stock of a corporation or the membership interests or units in a limited liability company. And when you do a transaction like that, what has to happen is the parties have to agree on the enterprise value of the corporation or the limited liability company. That's often the difficult task. How do you determine what a very early stage company is worth before you can see if there's market acceptance for their product or solution? Or before they even have a product or solution that's even been prototyped yet? Or that has hit the point of commercial exploitation? Or hopefully actually producing revenue? And so many investors have come to recognize that trying to come up with a valuation for a company at that stage of development is both very difficult and often is nothing more than a crapshoot. And so while equity investments in priced or valued deals continues to be the mainstay of early stage investing by angels, by friends and family, um, and certainly by early stage venture funds, there is an alternative today to that kind of equity deal. And that alternative is a convertible note financing. Instead of trying to go through the process of actually determining the valuation today and coming up with what the equity instrument's going to be, common stock or preferred stock, and if it's preferred stock, what are the special bells and whistles rights, preferences, and designations that are going to attach to that preferred equity instrument. Instead, what an increasing number of investors are doing is they're saying, we understand that we don't know what the valuation is today. So instead of going through those machinations, we're going to lend the company money on a convertible note basis. And these are normally relatively low interest rate loans that will automatically and mandatorily convert to an equity instrument at that point in the future when the company has evolved and matured to the point where a priced equity round may be more appropriate and the earlier investor agrees to take the same security, whether it's common stock or preferred stock, on the same terms and conditions as the subsequent equity investor does, but they get rewarded for coming in early, for taking that early risk. And what happens is they normally get some discounted price off of the price that's negotiated in the later stage equity round. It's not uncommon to see 15 to 20 percent discounts off of the price paid by the subsequent investor. It's also not uncommon to see the earlier investor rewarded with a warrant kicker, an ability to buy a, 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 basically a contract, a warrant, where they can buy additional shares at the subsequent, on the terms and conditions of the subsequent deal so that they can increase their share of the equity in the company. As with most things, there's an upside and a downside avoiding the machinations of determining the equity value, the fair market value, the enterprise value of the organization means that the transactional documents in a convertible note financing tend to be much simpler. They're easier to get done. The deal can get done much more quickly. So from agreement to consummation of the transaction is usually a shorter time period in a convertible note financing transaction than it is in a priced equity round. The cost of capital, the expenses associated with doing the transaction, also are a fair amount less in a convertible note financing transaction than in a priced equity round. So those are some upsides. There are some downsides as well. You know, one of the downsides we hear is that some investors believe that they're taking equity risk but getting a debt return. And that's not very satisfying to some equity investors, so they don't like doing convertible note deals. There's also some risk that a subsequent investor will not be happy with 
the discount between what that subsequent investor is paying and the discounted price that's effectively awarded to that earlier stage investor who took the convertible note financing. And uh, that can make it more difficult to do your next round of capital. So on balance, there are some people who hate convertible note transactions. There are some people who think they're a panacea. I tend to fall with some middle ground on that. They are not perfect transactions and they are not terrible transactions. And for some companies at some stage of development, depending upon their needs and their access to future capital, a convertible note financing can be a terrific transaction as a bridge from where the company is to the point where it's a viable venture capital candidate, for example. And so uh, the, the convertible note financing certainly should be considered. They should be examined closely. The pros and cons should be considered and a decision made based on what's in the best interest of the company, given its needs and its stage of development. Within the priced equity rounds, we should talk about the fact that there's really two forms of deals. There's garden variety common stock deals, which tend to have relatively few bells and whistles, all the way up to a very sophisticated preferred equity instrument where there are all kinds of rights and preferences and privileges that come along with being a preferred equity investor. And so those are really the, the two main areas with two different types of securities within the priced equity round that most companies will be considering when trying to raise capital. In recent years, there's been a real growth in the whole accelerator program and access to accelerators all over the country. And certainly in the Northeast, this has become a very important part of funding early stage companies in New York, in Pennsylvania, and now in New Jersey as well with the advent of TechLaunch, which is the state's first accelerator program. It was financed by private individuals with matching dollars from the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. It's an opportunity for really early stage companies to get some seed capital, get access to the network that we talked about previously, and provide them with a footing on which to build their company. And they get the opportunity to be mentored, to be introduced into the network, to be housed in a place where other startup companies are also at that very early stage of development. And so for the really pure startup entrepreneur, uh, accelerators should certainly be considered as one of the ways to obtain some early stage financing and get into the network of uh, individuals and, and investors who are interested in technology companies. We should also consider that in many states, there are government programs or quasi-government programs that provide assistance to business enterprises that are going to create their headquarters in a particular region, in a particular state. State government is, in most states, very anxious for job creation in their states. And so there are programs for companies that are going to be job creators where there's assistance available to them, sometimes in the form of grants, sometimes in the form of, of loans, guaranteed loans, um, that companies and entrepreneurs should consider and avail themselves of depending upon where they're going to be developing their own company. First and foremost, a very wise venture capitalist told me that we are in an era when it's no longer enough to have something that's nice to have. And so I would say first and foremost, to be attractive to prospective investors, an entrepreneur has to develop something that his or her potential customers have to have. So what are the things that people have to have? It's those items, those solutions, those products that either drive revenue, every business wants, new revenue sources. So if you have something that can drive revenue, that's how you make yourself attractive to a prospective investor. If you're not on the revenue side, if you are a productivity enhancer, you have a solution that reduces costs, 
decreases the amount of labor that's necessary to accomplish something, otherwise makes the marketing effort more efficient. That's another way to make yourself attractive to prospective investors because you have something that your customers have to have. If you're not driving revenue, you better be helping them reduce their costs. Do more with less, increasing productivity. How can they produce more with fewer resources? Or reduce costs. Because all of that and yours to the benefit of the bottom line, you can make the company that's your targeted customer or client earn more revenue, I'm sorry, earn a greater degree of profit. So increase revenue, decrease costs, drive profitability. Those are the ways that you make yourself attractive. But you know, that's from the business concept. How do you make yourself attractive from the legal sense? Well, you want to have a management team in place that inspires confidence. How do you do that? You assemble a team that's been there and done that before. There's nothing like a serial success story to inspire prospective investors to open their wallets. Not all entrepreneurs have the benefit of having done it before. So those entrepreneurs need to be able to demonstrate why a prospective investor should invest in them. Why would they back you? So you have to show your passion, your enthusiasm, your skill set, and make sure that that resonates with prospective investors. If you haven't done it before, make sure you educate yourself. If you haven't done it before, surround yourself with people who have. Prospective investors look at you know, who you run with, so to speak. Who is your accounting firm? Who is your law firm? Who is your financial advisor? Who are your corporate partners? How is it that you are developing what, you are, what your solution or product is? And if you do that in a way that inspires confidence, that builds trust, that shows that you are a reliable partner to work with, that's going to increase your attractiveness to a prospective investor. Similarly, there's nothing like success to make you attractive. Meet your deadlines. Beat your deadlines. Don't negatively surprise your prospective investors. If you provide them with projections, show them that you can at least meet them, if not beat them. Fail to meet your projections and you will be less attractive. Don't overpromise. You want to promise enough to make you interesting, and then you want to deliver. Delivering on what you promise to do is a clear way to make you attractive. Don't be sloppy in your business dealings. Make sure you cross those T's, dot those I's, have the appropriate documentation in place, form the company, create the document flow to show that the chain of title is there and unquestionable. Develop an appropriate intellectual property strategy to protect your IP. Make sure if you do hire people, you're hiring people that um, you've vetted, you've done your diligence, you enter into the appropriate documentation with them. All of these things will make you more attractive to a prospective investor. Our law firm is sort of uniquely situated in that we represent companies from inception. When, when an entrepreneur first conceives of an idea all the way up to maturity and the high end of, of the middle market, for example. So even companies or entrepreneurs, before there's a company that's been formed, when they have a concept in mind, they should be talking to their advisors, whether it's their legal advisors, their accounting, financial advisors, or, or all of the above, because you want to make sure that you protect what it is you are developing and, and developing this in the right way so that you can ultimately enjoy the benefits of monetizing what it is you have produced. So I would say it's important to get your advisors, including your legal advisors, involved early in the process because you want to think about your exit even as you are entering. You want to preserve your flexibility going forward. You want to make sure that you don't inadvertently give up your ability to patent technology by publicly disclosing it. 
You want to make sure that you don't inadvertently give up a trade secret by disclosing it to somebody or by not protecting it in the appropriate way. When you're starting to assemble your team and you're thinking about how are you going to provide equity incentives, who are going to be your partners, I think it's critical to be advised. You know, it's, it's a really interesting dilemma because it goes back to that issue of scarce resources with lots of needs. But that's why it's important to find the right partners who also believe in what you are doing. You know, I'm, I'm such a fortunate guy in that I get to work with scores of entrepreneurs, technologists, innovators. Um, I am always amazed at the innovation and the entrepreneurial inclinations of people. But having said that, not every great technology is a great business idea. And, you know, it's as important to know that early on as it is to do all the other things we've been talking about. Because you don't want to go down the path of spending lots of time and effort and money pursuing something that ultimately may not result in a commercializable product or service. So getting that go-no-go no go decision early on is as critical as, as all of the other things that we do to protect our technology and build the company the right way and raise the capital. And by talking with and uh, brainstorming with those kinds of trusted advisors, you are more likely to get to the go-no-go no go decision in a much more efficient fashion. Thank you.